Thank you, Daniel, Lois, and, and Van. Uh, I think we got a little taste of what's to come. We worship the King forever and ever. I loved reading from Revelation and then singing, joining our voices with those all over the world now and throughout all eternity. Let's pray together. Lord, you reign. You are the Lord God Almighty, and you reign now and forever. And we need to be reminded that you do reign and you will reign every day, every moment of our lives. So thank you for this little reminder as we gather as your people and bow ourselves before your grace and your power and your might and ask you to speak to us through your word. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. I I don't know if you're paying much attention to the Olympics these days or not. I am watching them all the time, and I am convinced that we need to have, um, we need, America needs credit for the medals won by those who train in the U.S. Have you noticed that? They keep talking about all these people from different countries who like go to school here or train here. I'm like, we should get half a medal for that. I think we're also the only country that counts total medals. Everybody else only cares about golds, but we count total medals, but we're catching up, and so I, I obsess about these things. Maybe you do as well. Um, I don't know if you uh, enjoy courtroom dramas. Anybody watch... Uh, was a Law and Order fan, or maybe like my, my, my parents, Perry Mason, back in the day, or maybe you watched Suits. We, we love these sorts of things. We love courtroom dramas on TV. I'm going to tick through some of the most famous trials in history that have shaped history and that we still talk about today or written about. See if you can guess them by the image on the screen. This first trial is the, anybody know? Yeah, probably not. This is the trial and the execution of Socrates. Plato there turning his face away, one of his uh, pupils, 399 B.C. Now, maybe not one you think about too often, but still famous in literature. How about this one? Who's that guy with his hand over his chest? The trial of Martin Luther. Come on, now you should be getting this one, the Diet of Worms, when he's on trial for heresy before the cardinal there, being accused of heresy by the Roman Catholic Church. How about this one? William Jennings Bryan in the middle. This is the Scopes Monkey Trial. Uh, formerly the state of Tennessee versus John Thomas Scopes. Some of you remember this in 1925, uh, the uh, evolution being, or creation being taught in schools. How about this trial? Anybody? Nuremberg, Nuremberg trials, 1945 and 46. And this one you'll all get. I know you'll get this one. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. The O.J. Simpson trial. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. From 1995. But the most famous trial in all of human history, the trial that shaped all of human history, the trial which we ought to be most focused on and be uh, most like, grateful for what God did there was a trial we're going to look at in our series called Face to Face. It's the encounter between Pontius Pilate and Jesus Christ. The trial that will lead to his crucifixion, which will be his atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world, which we're going to celebrate as we come to the end of the service at his table. But it begins in this really fascinating exchange between Jesus and the Roman prefect or the governor of the region. So I'm going to read from John chapter 18, uh, verse, uh, through, verse 28 through chapter 19, verses 16. It says 6, but it's actually 16. So you have your Bibles, you can follow along with me or follow on the screen. John chapter 18, beginning with verse 28. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord? Or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. 
Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he'd said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe that came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to him, to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you? and authority to crucify you. Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out, sat down on the judgment seat at a place, called, a place called the Stone Pavement in Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to be crucified. I know it's a long text, but it is high drama. Uh, there's so much in there. I say this often, but we, this could really be a dozen sermons. Uh, so I've struggled to condense it down to one for you today. But I encourage you to reflect on this passage. There was some scholarly debate, you may not know this, about whether or not Pontius Pilate, if the New Testament records had this right. Not that he existed, there's records of his existence, but that the date of his uh, of this timing of him being the governor of Judea might have been wrong. Until in 1961, this stone was discovered. It's referred to as the Pilate Stone. They found it as a, uh, used as one of the steps going up into a palace, but that was a secondary use. It was originally like a dedication stone for a temple dedicated to the, the emperor Tiberius, who was the emperor at this time. The inscription on the stone read, uh, to, dedicated to Roman Emperor Tiberius, Contains the time and the dates, Judea, uh, Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilatus, prefect of Judea, 32 AD. And we're told, we know he, he governed in Judea from 30, 26 to 37 AD. So anyway, in 1961, it was verified that, yeah, this is the guy that the New Testament's been telling us about living in that area. Prior to this trial, Jesus, you might know the story, has been arrested in the garden, betrayed by his friend Judas with a kiss, taken away in chains, led to the high priest's house and, and sort of this mock trial, uh, this, this mockery of a trial in the high priest's courtyard where he's, um, they can't even come to agreement on, on what the charges are. First century rules of the Sanhedrin, that's the high council, that's the Jewish high council. Think like religious supreme court and civic authority all rolled into one. In, in, in Israel, but they have limited power and authority because the, of the Roman rule. You notice in the text, they, are, they, can, they can convict people and punish people according to their religious laws, Jews that is. They couldn't do that to any Gentile, but they could not execute capital punishment. Only Rome could do that. So they, uh, the, the rules were that uh, of the Sanhedrin, their own Jewish rules in the first century were that there could be no trials by night, no secret proceedings. Everything had to be done in, in front of witnesses and two or three witnesses that agreed perfectly before any accusation could be brought. 
Every one of these things is violated in the, tr the trial of Jesus before he ever gets to Pilate. The Sanhedrin cannot come to agreement about the exact nature of his crimes, and they don't have authority to carry out the punishment, so they drag him to Pilate. And we're told this is to, have, this is to fulfill what, was, what Jesus said about his own death. Remember, if the Jews were to execute him, they would do so by stoning. Cast someone down and stone them to death. The Roman execution for non-Jews, criminals, enemies of Rome, was crucifixion. Raise someone up on a cross. Jesus talked about this, that he was going to be crucified, that he was going to be raised up. The Old Testament prophets talked about this. You're going to see this throughout. There's more going on in this story than just Jewish authority, Roman authority, and this guy Jesus. The whole thing, the whole story is about one question. And I want you to keep it in your mind. Here it is. The inescapable question of Jesus. This, this entire story is about this. What are you going to do with Jesus? How do you respond to him? What do you do with him? It's what this sermon is about. Actually, it's probably what every sermon ought to be about, the inescapable question of Jesus. In this encounter, there's 12 questions asked. Pilate asks 11 of them. Jesus only asks one. He says, did you get that from your, is that your own idea or did somebody else tell you about me? Pilate's asking the questions. You know, I think um, I've, I've been tinkering around with AI. I don't know if you've used any of those uh, search engines. It, all, it has everything to do with the questions you ask it, right? If you, you can refine your search by different questions, and it gets more and more accurate. I was doing some things about could, could AI give a, an accurate theological interpretation of passages? And as long as I keep asking the right questions, it, it does pretty well. Um, I think that's a metaphor for life. I think a lot of life is arriving at and asking with an open mind and heart the right questions. Bringing the right questions. And we're going to see that here in this story. I want us to look at three sub-questions about this question, the question of Jesus, what to do with him. The first one is the question of guilt. It's a pretty big question. What has Jesus done to even deserve to be there? What is he guilty of? What's he accused of? And what is he guilty of? In our culture today, if you're accused of something in the court of public opinion, you're pretty much guilty, right? I mean, it doesn't take much for someone's reputation to be destroyed. You can be accused of something, you can spread all over the place, and you could be you know, found guilty of that in the court of public opinion. And whenever you find something out, like you know, I, this happens all the time, right? There's all kinds of assumptions made, and people react, oh, and then you find out later that it wasn't exactly what we thought it was on social media. And, but nobody ever retracts it. Nobody ever writes. The, nobody ever corrects the story. We just move on and assume certain things. What has Jesus done to be guilty of? Look at verses 18, uh, 28 to 32 again. Excuse me. They led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters, so they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. I mean, the the, the, the hypocrisy is rich here. So Pilate went outside to them and said. What accusation do you bring against this man? Like, what are the charges? Why are you bothering me? What's he done? You should have a reason for bringing him to me. You could handle it yourselves. And what's their answer? If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. <laughs> you hear what they say? Oh, trust us, he's bad. Like, you know, they can't even tell that there's no specific charge at all. Just, it's a bad guy. Trust us, take us at our word. Would that ever hold up in a court of law? Can you imagine like a, like, a, like a Law and Order episode? Oh, he's bad. Well, if you say so, okay, guilty, bang. It doesn't work like that. We're going to see over and over again, Pilate, he's going to try everything he can to wiggle off the hook, off this question of Jesus. He wants to avoid it at all costs. He'll go to great lengths not to have to deal with it. But in the end, he's going to have to answer the question, what do you do with Jesus? He cannot escape it. Two times, Pilate says that he cannot find any guilt for this. Man. Actually, three times, two we'll look at here. In, in verse 38b, we'll see it. After he'd said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. It should be over right there. Like, have you ever wondered, why does, Pilate, what does he care about what do these, Jews, these Jewish authorities think? Why does he just say, he's not guilty, your problem? Because he's afraid of, of, the, of a riot and a revolt, we find out in the text that he was even more afraid. Remember that when he went back inside, he was even more afraid. Part of what happened in Pilate's history is early in his tenure as governor, he had put um, emblems of Caesar and Roman gods on shields and banners that, had, that were outside the temple, and Jews revolted. They didn't want any uh, images other than the, uh, no, no images 
in the temple, and they freaked out, and they protested. And to put down the protest, he had several of them executed and crucified. And they, they revolted and appealed to Caesar. And Tiberius sent a message basically saying, stop killing the Jews, keep the peace, or I'm going to have you removed. And by removed, probably he means executed. So he's nervous about, I don't want this to go bad. I don't want a, an uprising. I've already had that before, and it didn't go well for me. He's trying to just keep it tamped down. We see in verse, chapter 19, verses 1 through 6. I'll read 1 through 6. You'll just see verses 5 and 6 here on the screen. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. That's interesting. Flogged is, we'll talk about what that is. Why have him beaten if, he's not, if you find no guilt in him? And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe, mocking his claim to be king, right? Purple, the color of majesty and royalty. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. See, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know I find no guilt in him, although I've just beaten him half to death. But here he is, he's not guilty. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns, the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. Can you hear him just trying to get out of this? He clearly thinks if I have Jesus beaten severely, they'll see him bloody, beaten, half dead, you know, a pitiful figure, and they'll think, okay, okay, enough is enough. It'll placate them. It'll satisfy them. But that's not how it's going to go. That's not what happens. The Jewish leaders are not going to be satisfied with a beating. They want Jesus executed. And this too is to fulfill what's being spoken to us through the prophets. Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 through 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Speaking not just about crucifixion wounds, but the wounds of scourging or flogging. Some of you know what flogging is. 39 lashes with a Roman instrument called a flagrum. It had leather straps with pieces of bone, metal, or glass tied to the end jagged. It was intentionally designed to do as much damage to soft tissue as possible. Blood loss and trauma, just keeping someone alive. Sometimes people died from scourging. But to make them, the point was to punish them severely and they wouldn't take as long on the cross. So it's a, it's a brutal punishment. Jesus suffers here. Throughout this whole encounter, the Jews are, are, are scheming. Pilate is maneuvering. And God is working. One of the things that strikes me every time I read this is God's at work. It feels like, you know, on the surface of it, the Jews are trying to manipulate Pilate. Pilate's, tr Pilate's trying to keep the peace and get out of it. But God is orchestrating things that nobody at the time has any idea of. And that encourages me about my life and our life right now. So Jesus Christ is on trial and suffering not because he's guilty of anything. Pilate says it. But because he's innocent. And this matters why. Because he's going to the cross to be the perfect sacrifice for sin once for all. We see this throughout the New Testament in First Peter, chapter 2. He committed no sin. In, Luke, in Hebrews chapter 10, he's the perfect sinless lamb of God. He's the sacrifice without sin, without spot, without blemish. This brings us to the second question, the question of a king. I think this is the central question of the whole text. It's certainly Pilate's big question. He does not care about Jewish law. He does not care about theological issues. He cares about one thing, keeping the peace, keeping the people placated under the thumb of Rome. And he basically wants to know, are you a political threat? Are you a political figure? Are you going to be a problem for me or for Caesar or for us in Rome? This is what he wants to know. This is a confrontation between Jesus Christ and political power. Then... And I would suggest it has a lot to say about that now. Pilate represents the power of Rome, the greatest kingdom and political power the world had ever known up to that time. Pilate represents this. Jesus represents a very different kind of power, a very different kind of kingdom. Look at verses 33 through 37. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, 
are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, this is the only question Jesus asks. Is that your idea, Pilate? Or did somebody tell you about that? Who have you been talking to? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? He's annoyed. Can you hear it? It's not my business. I don't care about this. Your own nation, the chief priest, had delivered you over to me. What have you done? Like, spill it, Jesus. Cut to the chase. I don't have time for this. I don't want to get engaged in this. Just tell me what the issue is. Jesus answers, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. When Pilate asked the question, are you a king of the Jews, he's not asking a theological question. He's asking a political question. And Jesus' answer is so ambiguous at first. You, you know, like, I, he's, it's, it's, it's an answer, but a non-answer. In verse 34, where did you get this idea? In verse 35, Pilate's clearly irritated. In verse 36, Jesus says, I'm not a king. Not like you're thinking. But in verse 37, he says, you say that, and that's why I've come into the world. So it's sort of like, no, not really, but yes. Well, what is it, Jesus? He's being ambiguous on purpose. If Jesus were a king, like Caesar, his followers would have tried to bring about his kingdom like all followers of earthly kings do. I want you to notice this in our current political climate, what it says right here. If my kingdom were of this world, my followers would act like the people, the followers of kings of this world. Fight, fight, attack, claim power, coerce. But that's not how it works in the kingdom of Christ. That's not how my followers are doing. And you might be thinking, yeah, well, but um, Pastor Jeff, they have throughout history. <laughs> Some of his followers have done this. Yeah, we have frequently gotten this backwards. Fought, demanded, attacked. With the sword, crusades in history, Christendom in, in, in the Middle Ages, Europe, and sometimes even still today. But Jesus is saying, that's not actually how my kingdom works at all. It works by a much more radical kind of power than that. Matthew 26, verse 52, Peter gets it wrong. He grabs a sword. Remember this story in the garden? And he says, you're not going to take my Jesus. And he cuts off the ear of, the, of one of the servants of the high priest, one of the guards. Jesus says to him, what? Attaboy, Peter, get him. No, what does he say? Put your sword away. Put that away, Peter. Those who take it up will die by it. That's not how this is going to work. That's not how this is going to go. Christians have gotten this backwards many times, but Jesus never intended for his followers to spread the gospel of his kingdom through political power. That doesn't mean Christians shouldn't hold political office, shouldn't care about political things, shouldn't lobby for, for spiritual and gospel influences in society. Of course we should. But the kingdom of Christ does not spread because his followers hold the hammer, are in power. Do you understand the difference? It's a really important difference. Like on the one hand, we'd say, there's the response of, well, then just get me out of it altogether and I'll just go away and pray. And just, it'll just be my own internal kingdom in my heart. On the other extreme is like, we have to be in the halls of power calling the shots for any of this to work. And Jesus says, you're both wrong. You're both wrong. Care about this world. Engage in this world. Spread the gospel of love and mercy and grace and justice and peace and joy through your life in this world. But don't despair if you're not in the seats of power. You never have been. And until I return, you never will be. That's not how this works. So when Jesus says his kingdom is not of this world, he's not saying his kingdom has no impact on this world. He does not mean his kingdom is only about how you feel on the inside or what happens after you die. He's saying that his kingdom does not operate on the principles of the kingdoms of this world. Not the value systems or the power structures of this world. 
He speaks about his kingdom. Do you know Jesus talked about his kingdom? It was like his favorite subject to talk about. He's always talking about it in the Gospels. A couple references we see in the New Testament. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Not the kingdom of God is at hand, so let's march. Let's take up swords. Let's go get Pilate. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What kind of power? We'll get to that. Proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness, without hindrance. That's his followers in Acts 28 after his resurrection. Romans 4.17, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So Pilate can't see it, but the kingdom of Christ is far more subversive and dangerous to him than he thinks. He's probably thinking, okay, this guy's not really a threat. I find no guilt in him. He's not a big threat to us. How can I get out of this? But he's going to discover, or we're going to see, that the kingdom of God is actually far more dangerous. It does not grow by conquest or coercion, but like a mustard seed. Think about the way Jesus talks about it. Like a mustard seed. Like a hidden treasure. Like a sower in a field. And who does the kingdom belong to? It belongs to the meek, the peacemakers, the pure in heart. It cares about the oppressed and the poor. The kingdom is built on grace and it overflows with justice, bringing true freedom to all who are followers of the king. Poor Pontius Pilate. You feel, I almost feel sorry for him. He's talking to the king about the kingdom, but he can't see the truth. And this brings us to the question of the truth. The question of truth. I think the most ironic thing about this whole story is the, is the question that's so famous that Pilate asks. It's like a postmodern question. What is truth, he asks. The most ironic moment in this whole encounter when Pilate asks this question. Look at verses 37 to 38. Then Pilate said to him, so you're a king. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? Can you hear this, just the uh, cynicism? He's a, very, he's a political animal to the core. Um, Vaclav Havel, who wrote, who, um, Gave an, you can Google this speech. Uh, gave an incredible speech, and it's an acceptance speech of an award, um, H-A-V-E-L, about the, the, the use of power in political circles. He says, when most politicians who, get, who get, rise to power or, or are aspiring to be elected or put in power, they want to use, they want to use the truth. Uh, they want to use their power to bring about truth. They want to use their influence to bring about what's right and true and good. What happens over time because of our own corrupted hearts is we start to want to use truth to retain power. It gets reversed over time. Pilate, I don't, I don't honestly think, I, I, I'll admit my own skepticism about the political world we live in. I don't honestly think you can get very high in political halls these days without being corrupted on this point, without having to compromise uh, your values, your moral systems, and your, your view of the truth. I think it inevitably goes that way. In our culture, right, we, we see debates between political candidates, and then we see a scorecard about how many lies they each told, fact-checking it. Who's telling the truth? Yet here Jesus is saying to Pilate, who's been, he's, been, he's, he's a political animal in Rome, if you want to be on the side of truth, listen to my voice. John 14, verses 5 and 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the truth. You're looking at truth. It's me, he says. In John 8, 31 to 32, he says, the truth will set you free. There is real freedom and real power in knowing the truth, in knowing Jesus. Truth is not abstract for the Christian. It's deeply personal. I would just say, I feel this way sometimes. When you're uh, reading your social media feed, which is curated, by the way, to give you a view skewed to your tastes. And you're wondering, is this true? Is this true? Where can I find truth? Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. 
Pilate thinks he's putting truth on trial, but he's about to discover that he actually is the one on trial. Look at verses 9 through 11 of of chapter 19 as we finish up this story here. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Don't you know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. This is, this Pilate's statement here is astounding. Don't you know who you're talking to, Jesus? Don't you know the power of life and death that I hold? Think about what Pilate is saying and who he's saying it to. Doesn't he know? Actually, you could flip those questions around. Do you know who you're talking to, Pilate? Do you know the power he holds? Now Jesus speaks. My life is not in your hands. It never has been. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I lay my life down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. No one takes it from me. Least of all you, Pilate. I love the way he responds here. I think you need to let this soak in for a minute. What power do you think you have, Pilate? What power do you think you have, Christian? What power do you think you could possibly have in this world that does not come from God? And all this mockery of a trial, this corruption and coercion, even the floggings, it's all part of a much bigger story, a higher purpose. In Acts chapter 2, verse 23, we see it uh, spoken of this way, the great uh, speech given before the Jews by Peter and the apostles. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. I just want you to notice what's said here in a couple places. According to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Think about this whole trial, everything we're reading about, Jews scheming, Pilate twisting, all of it according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. I want to pause there and ask you, do you believe that's still true today? Do you believe that everything that happens in this world, as, as, as uncertain and confusing and painful and fearful as it might be, happens inside of the plan and foreknowledge of God? Do you think that anything that happens anywhere on the planet is outside of that? Is it possible that things could happen where God goes, didn't plan on that? Now what? Come on, let's get the angels together and come up with a plan B. We put it to you this way. God is able to bring about his purposes even through the actions of sinful leaders who do not even acknowledge him or his authority. God is able to bring about his purposes through people that don't even believe he exists. Thumb their nose at him. I'm not saying that we should always like that. But it's true. It should be something that holds us. We're not, we don't fall off into the abyss of fear as Christians. The Savior of the world was not in the Sanhedrin. He was not in Rome. But he was able to use the Sanhedrin and Rome to bring about his divine purpose. Let me say this another way for our context. And maybe you, maybe you want to remember this one when we get to November. Our God is able to work out his ultimate purposes even through a candidate you believe to be a huge mistake or a terrible choice. You believe that? Well, that depends on how the election goes. No. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us to believe this, to cling to this truth, especially now as your people. All right, last few verses. Verses 12 through 16. Pilate's been trying to get out of it, trying to get out of it, and he can't. Here's how it ends. Verses 12 through 16. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, behold your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. That's a shocking thing for Jewish chief priests to say. 
So he delivered him over to them to be crucified, and they took Jesus. A couple things here. First, the Jews say to Pilate, we have no king but Caesar. And if you don't do this, you're no friend of Caesar. And that sort of sets up the question of Jesus in a way I want you to see on the screen here. Friend of Caesar or friend of Jesus? What does it mean? And I think to this day, right now, we all have to make our choice. Am I going to align myself with the power structures and value systems of the world? Or am I going to align my heart with the selflessness and sacrificial love of my Savior? I think we're going to be tested the, the next several months this next year. We're going to be put to the test as followers of Jesus on that question every day. Where's my heart going to align? The same question Pilate faces is the one that faces each of us. Matthew 27, verse 22, he puts it this way. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? Could it be clearer? Okay, well, what do I do with him? The question of Jesus is as inescapable for you and me as it was for Pontius Pilate. Nobody gets out of it. And you can come to church and you can be mildly religious and never answer the question. So I'll put it to you. What then do you do with Jesus who is called the Christ? What do you do with him? You must make your choice. Pilate made his. I want to, we don't have time for the quote, but C.S. Lewis famously said, you can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him, mock him, and crucify him, or you can fall on your knees and call him Lord. Those are the options. Now, there's a perfect uh, lead-in for us to come to his table. So if you don't have your elements, please put your hand up. The ushers will bring them to you. But pull out the cup, and remember, on the bottom layer is where the bread is. And I want to remind you that Jesus, who was innocent, faced the trial and the injustice of the beating and the crucifixion of the cross so that we who are guilty might experience freedom and joy and not have to face what we justly deserve. He faced what he did not deserve so that we could get what we don't deserve, his peace and his righteousness and his joy. And we remember that when we come to his table. So just peel off that bottom layer, grab the bread. Let me remind you that Jesus called himself the bread of life and said, this is my body. It is given for you. Let's eat this in his memory. And the scripture says that after they ate, they, Jesus poured out a cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And as often as we drink this cup, we proclaim his death and resurrection. We're proclaiming his kingdom until he returns. Let's do that together. Jesus, our king, we give you all the praise and glory. Forgive us for fretting and worrying and aligning ourselves with the kingdoms of this world. Help us as your children and as your followers to align our hearts with your selfless love and your sacrificial giving, self-giving for us and for the world. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, it's worth clapping for. He is our living hope. <laughs> We're funny, aren't we? Our living hope, yes. Yeah. You know, Jesus once stood before the judgment seat of Pilate and went to the cross. You and I will one day stand before the judgment seat of Jesus. And he he is, and he can be your living hope. And I just want, don't let this moment pass. If you're here this morning and you don't know him that way, but you want to, come right down front, talk to me, go back there to the room in the lobby, the glass room, the prayer room. Members of the prayer team would love to encourage you and to pray with you that you could know Jesus as your king and your living hope. Now, may the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Spirit and the grace of the Lord Jesus be with us now and forever until he returns. Amen.